you'd think I'd have this all lined up so after we did all that work the other day. So a funny thing happened. I, um, we, we did all of our tech checks over the last few days with the guests, and um, Skype wanted to install a patch, and it, it patched itself. And uh, all of a sudden, nothing worked. No. <laughs> all right, let's let's go over to let's go over to Steve. There we go. We'll bring him on. There's Steve Lasker. Thanks so much for joining us. And what's what's the hat? Hey. Uh, I don't know. It was some hat that I had to keep the sun <laughs> off me. It was just something <laughs> random. And sailing world. Get rid I, of the hat. I, I'm wearing a company hat, and Steve with the sailing <laughs> hat. Okay. Um, so well, it's containers. I was going to pull up a picture of uh, me sailing in the sound or something with container ships. So, um, whatever. Now I need to put the hat back on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, so uh, it, it's it's <laughs> tremendous to have you on here. I'm I'm at a loss for words. It, thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to join us. For folks who don't know who you are, can you give a, a quick introduction? Yeah, sure. So um, I work in, I'm a program manager at Microsoft. I work on the Azure Container Registry. Uh, I've worked on a bunch of other stuff for Visual Studio tooling. Um, I did some initial work on the VS Code extension for Docker, but Chris Diaz did all the work that you see today. He's done an amazing job with it. Um, and I try to work on our end-to-end -end experiences for containers uh, in Azure. So it's it's a fun space. It's, it really is a fun space to kind of see the the dramatic changes of things and to the thing that I like to think about is just it, we have this, the problems haven't changed. We've been doing this same coding, you know, for problems that customers have for years, but the choices of technologies we have change and it's just a total paradigm shift. So it's really been a lot of fun to kind of rethink all the ways we've gone about fixing things in the past. Oh yeah. And uh, folks in the chat room are saying you look like you're in front of an elevator and it's on floor 114. Oh yeah, I guess that would be uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see if it goes up. Over time, we'll yeah, yeah. get a, a floor at a time. So um, so when we talk about containers, right, and, and to some folks who haven't worked with containers, right, it's kind of a nebulous thing. It's a virtualization thing. You've been doing a lot of work in this space. You've you've made it a lot easier for folks to get into and get started with. And, and they have, you know, folks have questions, you know, it, is it something I can rely on? Is this a Microsoft only thing, yeah. right? Is it, do I need to be concerned? And, and it sounds like you're the right person to talk to, to really figure out that, that how do I get involved and why should I use containers? And then how easy it is to start really taking advantage of that, like you were saying, to do some of those things that I'm already doing, but in a container way. Yeah, and you know, thank you. Uh, there's a lot of great people at Microsoft that are working on containers, and um, I've been working on it for a couple of years now. It's kind of weird to think about how far back when we started this weird project of, hey, can you take a look at this? We don't know if it's going to turn into anything, and we did some early incubation, and it's turned into the way you package app uh, code uh, to deploy. Um, but we've got some great people here. I'm Brendan Burns, the you know, one of the innovators of uh, the founding founding fathers founders of uh, Kubernetes has joined. Uh, with him joining, we have people like Jesse Frizzell and Gabe and the folks from Deus. Um, it's it really is a fun place to work because containers are not a Microsoft thing. Um, we are trying to engage in the community, and we are. I shouldn't say Microsoft aren't containers aren't a Microsoft thing. This was something that was done. Uh, outside of Microsoft, and then we have in, been engaging in it. And I think we have a really good center of excellence of some, some awesome and amazing people uh, at Microsoft working on containers here. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so so you had some other things, but I had to react to uh, – I am one of many great people that here are working on containers. Oh, yeah. So it, it, it there are other folks outside of Microsoft that are innovating in this space, and, and it really is – it's a it's a larger community than just Microsoft, right? There's there's folks at Google. There's folks at Amazon yep, that, so, are, right. that are doing tremendous things to make it work great in all of the clouds. No, it's true. I mean, the, the, one of the things that people get thinking about with containers, it's a great way to – containers is some ways the next generation of VM for virtualization. I mean, uh, for those that remember in the 2001s when VMs came out, it was you know a paradigm shift. It, it, was, it wasn't a major paradigm shift. I couldn't get multiple things installed on my lap on one machine, so we created these virtualized environments. Um, but they're pretty heavyweight. 
uh, with containers, it's much lighter weight. So the same way I was able to, in theory, move VMs from on-prem to cloud one, two, and three, you know, that, that's kind of the concept. But containers just take all of the problems that we've kind of lived through with VMs. So when you want to instance a VM on a machine, well, where do you get the image from? Right. right. You have to go figure out where is that VHD. And by the way, how do you create the VHD? Those those are just some of the basic things that we just accept as the norm uh, with VMs. With containers, what, and I, you got to give Docker a tremendous amount of credit here because while they didn't create containers, they made containers like VB. They are the VB of containers. They made it accessible. Uh, it, yeah. They, they said, look, here's these great technologies. Um, that we can pull together. And if I want to run something, you know, the most basic Docker run, if you say Docker run, hello world, like, well, you need a Docker client. We'll start with that and we'll talk about some things that we're doing in Azure on top of that. But the idea that I can just say Docker run or VM run, right, was like, well, that's not going to work. But with Docker run, it says, okay, there's a default pattern for how to find the image because the image is kind of like the VHD. Okay. Um, and you can say Docker run and it'll say, okay, I, I don't have one here, but I know how to get it. So it goes out to the internet. It goes to Docker Hub, uh, which is a default registry. And it says, well, I'll pull down uh, Hello World and then it'll start it up. Um, if I say Docker run again, sorry, Docker run Hello World again, um, it says, well, I already have one cached here, so I don't have to go download it from the internet again. I'll just spin it up and start it. So um, it's an, an image, literally, it's like a cookie cutter. It's it's that base thing, and we're just going to start copies of this thing. Exactly. And you just, you know, you start them right up. Um, and then the concept with containers, you know, with VMs, we tend to instance a VM, and then we pile on there, and we do all of this installation stuff. And we might go save it and do a sysprep and, you know, all this fun goo that just takes days and weeks on end right no, um, and nobody likes doing a windows install on a new on a new virtual machine every time they want to build a new one that's slightly exactly. different oh exactly so what docker has done is they have this concept of a docker file um where you can say from which is you know think of just object inheritance okay. you know, from my base class from my base image add some goo and then build it and then I can name that thing, and then we can push it. And we could actually play with this a little bit if you want. And um, it might, we'll, we'll start with the basics, then we'll start getting our hands dirty with some of these things. So um, the, the okay. basics of containers of just being this virtualization that has what I call a, a progressive disclosure. Um, I only need to know as much as I need to know to get my task done. Mm. Um, and, you know, think about learning some languages or, you know, I'd like to say, you know, even Kubernetes, you know, there's a lot you need to learn before you can go drive this thing. You know, you can't just jump in and start going. Um, and Docker did an amazing job of just making that, you know, progressive disclosure. I only need to know what I need to know to get the next task done. And it's very simple. You know, you don't need to know image layer caching. You don't need to know Docker exec or inspect or even tagging for that matter at first, right? Mm. You just, you start off and this is cool. And you get this immediate cool factor to it. Uh, and then you could go, all right, well, now I want to do the next thing. And I look up, well, how do I do this? Oh, you can do that this way. Um, okay. So it's it's a lot of fun to uh, to play with it. And um, uh, let's see, am I getting this right? Yeah, there we yeah, go. Yeah, you're good. Um, I'm looking at myself in the elevator as uh, my head's like kind of we, We've hidden the numbers now. We've cut that off at <laughs> oh, the top. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. You gotta, <laughs> well, we'll check on those every once in a while to see where <laughs> we're at. Um, so anyway, so the one of the things you know with with Docker and when we you know we think about it um, for customers trying to use it is especially in uh, you know for Azure we'll go with Azure but it could be for any cloud is uh, how do you where are you going to store your stuff you know Docker Hub is great for you know stuff I want to push out in the open and it's great for getting started uh, but these images are large in size they're anywhere from you know 100 meg or you know 50 meg for really really small basic ones okay um to a couple of gig i mean let's be fair there are it's not just windows you know when you're starting to do even java um and some of the node sdks and other things by the time you get all of your build dependencies in there and it's a great conversation itself uh, these images do get big okay so you want to have a registry that's what i call network close to where you're going to work and run um 
So if I'm in AWS, I'm going to use the uh, uh, ECR. And if I'm going to be in Google, I'll use GCR. And if you're in Azure, you would use the Azure Container Registry. We have, it's kind of like if I'm running in Azure, I'm not going to use a storage bucket from Google. It doesn't make sense, right? I want something close. Okay, um, sure. So that's where we have with ACR. And maybe that's a place if, do you want to do this where you're kind of hacking at code and I'll kind of guide you through and uh, I think we, we can, can do that. All right. A registry and we'll start so, pulling some images and them and having fun that way. All right. I need to resize over here again. This, once again, like I said, the, the magic of Skype just butchered things over here. Let me just. Right. Let me just cut this real quick. I think I put this at like 280. Oh no, too much. Um, and I need to take off a little on the left and the right. Sounds like I'm getting tailored here. Kind of, a little bit. We're gonna <laughs> make that, ta ta ta, because I want to make sure I get your picture in the top corner there so folks can see you while I'm doing the Visual Studio in Azure thing. All right, let's go over to this view. Hey, look at that. All right, pro streamer. Street, wow, and you got some ninja cat going on there. Absolutely, and I actually had folks say to me, oh man, where can we get that? And they don't share that wallpaper anymore. Um, all oh, right. that, yeah, I guess that is Ninja Cat. That was, uh, was guessing. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. All right, I am going to share my screen here so you can see what I have up. There you go. And I need and to bring that back. There we go. All right. Okay. How do we actually do this now? Because I'm watching uh, your streaming, but that's delayed. That's delayed What's by the... about three to five seconds. So I shared, I shared my screen over to you on Skype. Oh, okay. So you can look at that there one and you'll go. be able to watch... My my video yep, live. There we go. All right. All right. So let me bring up. Um, let's let's start with the in the portal. So um, let's create a registry. Um, All right. Let in me go back. Azure portal. All right. So I will go to portalazure.com. I think. All right. We wanted me to log in with my Microsoft one for this. Yes. Yes. Because we gave you some permissions to some of the resources I have. All right. And yes, I want the Microsoft one. Try that again. All right. Here we go. There's my dashboard. I don't remember. Do you have the Docker client installed? Like if you run PowerShell locally, do you have Docker available? I, I do. Can't remember. Yes. Okay. When we, well, let's do that first, actually. We'll, let's keep that up. We'll come back here in a second. Let's just do a standard Docker run, um, and we'll start from there. So um, you can say, you know, Docker run. All right. Space, hello world. All right. Now, I don't have the Hello World image locally. So, unable to find the image locally. So, and now, oh. Uh, Pull access, access denied. denied. What did I do? Nope. Docker's running locally. Why do you have to do a Docker login? Uh, that's interesting. Okay. Uh, do Docker info. Sure. Okay, you don't have... No, oh, it is it is running locally. That is interesting. Scroll up a little bit. You might... Is it in Windows mode? Uh, Docker no, it should be in Linux mode. And I actually... Uh, Docker for Windows OS type Linux. Because I actually... Yeah. So check this out, Steve. If you look in the video, there right under me, there's a couple widgets that you see on the Twitch video. Yeah. Right? That, that 2803 and that 141, those are actually coming out of an ASP.NET Core app that's running in a Docker container locally on this Windows machine. So type Docker PS. Oh, you know what? I think it's hello-world is what they're saying in the chat. Oh, uh, is it? Okay. I, I was actually going to do the next. There you go. Okay. Thank you. See? Yeah. Which, reference there we go. The wrong so you don't Pair have programming at its best. And it pulls it down. And it's based on a pretty small, I, I think it's an Alpine-based image, if, if even that much. And then, you know, if you look in the middle, it says, hello from Docker. Now, if we say Docker uh, images, Docker space images, we can see the images that are available locally, and you'll see hello world and all the other stuff you have there as well. Yep, it's only uh, one, look at that, it's barely 2K for hello world. Yeah, yeah, so they just, they, that's nice. They did this Moby thing a while ago. Uh, anyway, um, so that's kind of the basics. And now if we wanted to have that in our own registry, because 
so this is actually a good part of conversation on when I think about the container lifecycle management stuff. Um, and I, in fact, I got bit by this this morning because I was making reference to some things that are no longer out on the internet when I was trying to do a build. So it's just a, an interesting example. Okay. Uh, you tend to want to have snapshots of things that you can control, right? If you, even enterprises that run Windows Update, they don't take an update from Microsoft directly. They have what they, we call to WSUS. It's basically this Windows software update service that enterprises will pull in the latest version of Windows, whatever it is they want to test, and then they roll it out when they're comfortable and yeah. works with stuff. Um, and it's the same kind of model that you probably should think about here. You certainly want to have testing in place. So let's just do a really basic thing of just getting um, that image, the Hello World image, in a registry that we'll have in Azure. Okay. And then we'll escalate this quickly to a, a web app, but it's we don't have to worry about browsing pages or anything with the Hello World now. Okay. So let's go back to the Azure portal, and um, we'll browse through the visuals because the visuals are always much easier. And let's see, do you have container registries there somewhere? Um, uh, let's. Or if we pinned I, it yesterday or not? I did not pin it. So let's go to you know, do a search container registry, or a container should find it. There's lots right. of container stuff in. Which Oh, that's right. It's got this long search. I have access to a few subscriptions. Yeah. I've been trying to get out of subscriptions that I don't really do anything with because then I just get nag mails going, you have something on this that you haven't taken care of. It's, so. I, uh, I get a lot of those. <laughs> a lot. So, one of, well, um, that's not right. Uh, there we go. Container registries. And, oh, we could have pinned it, but that's okay. So um, click Add. All right. We'll create a new registry. And um, which subscription are we actually working in here? Uh, the, the ASP.NET resources. Okay. So you probably want to pick the one that you want to really put it in. Do you have a Fritz? I don't have one on my Microsoft account. It's on my personal account. Oh, okay. Why don't you, then you know what, stick it in uh, my subscription for now, and we'll, because uh, I gave you access to that yesterday. So give yourself a name at the top, and we'll actually just copy and paste it. We'll talk about resource groups as a good thing. So give yourself a, a J Fritz or whatever you want to do. Let's call this Fritz and Friends so we know it was on, on the show here. Uh, so just copy that, and actually this is something I want to change in the portal and default it, and just paste it in the resource group. Makes it easier to find. Now, the reason you want these uh, registry, and this is probably for any kind of persistence. One of the things that's nice about resource groups is when you're done with them, you can just delete them. And especially when you're hacking at you know relative demos, you want to be able to clean up something you know very easy. Oh my gosh, yes. With um, anything that has persistence, like a registry, a database, DocDB, and other things, you might actually want to keep those things around. And because registries are things that get the same registry can be used across multiple services, mm -hmm. you can put it in app service, you can put it in AKS, you can machine learning, Azure Batch, mm. uh, IoT, right? It's there's a ton of places that we're deploying things to, so we don't necessarily want to put the registry in with the first resource that we think we're going to deploy to. I like to put a registry in its own. And if I know I'm doing a demo, I'll probably put a dash delete after that to remind me that I can just delete this thing. Um, but that's that's kind of neither here nor there. Well, gosh, call it delete me dash. That's exactly what I do. I put a delete me after it uh, or before, either way. Yeah, yeah. So um, that's great. Well, uh, we're, everything else is fine. We'll now, just say. What's, what's the skew here? Ah, uh, skews. So this is us learning how to price uh, services. Um, so we have three tiers of SKUs. Basic is the five dollars a month. You know, really, you know, get yourself started so you have um, some use. And there's pretty good size on it for most people. Um, the and there's a, a page actually we talk about our SKUs. So if you uh, just why don't you create another tab there, and type aka.ms and this you'll see the pattern of how we do slash acr. And then if you do, uh, okay, well, actually, that's one of them. But okay. if you do ACR slash is where I was going to. That's our service. Okay, ACR slash. Slash pricing. Pricing. Actually, two SKUs first. Let's start at SKUs. Okay. 
And I got feedback that SKUs is like an old term and we should use tiers or something. So yeah. that's it, that's good feedback. So anyway, um, you can see here that we have the basic standard and premium. And basic is the way I think about it is where developers can just get started really cheap. Okay. There's plenty of capability in there. There's no lim no limits on the functionality as a developer that would use. It's got web hooks. It's got the ACR build capabilities we'll talk about. Um, standard now adds more storage that comes with it by default. We no longer have any limits on storage. It's a matter of um, some um, a certain amount comes with the amount you pay, kind of like you know phone plans. You can always exceed, but we don't have the old phone plan penalty if you exceed it. Um, we just charge you for the storage that you use. And then premium is really about those customers that have much higher concurrent uh, pull, concurrent pulls that they need to do. And they want to use a feature we call geo-replication, where you're running mm. in multiple locations. Uh, really super awesome feature for when you have dev teams. You're on the East Coast. I'm on the West Coast. You might have somebody in Europe. You all can geo-replicate your registry and um, you're going to have local operations. I'm going to have local operations and then we do eventual consistency to sync all those image layers together. Oh, very We'll do cool. a demo on that in a bit. Um, so that's kind of uh, some of this, the excuse. If you scroll up, you see some more. Uh, classic is something we're deprecating. We actually haven't done any development work in it in a year. Um, so it doesn't have delete capabilities. You, you really don't want to use Classic. Um, it's it's, we just haven't gotten to the process of deprecating it yet. Uh, gotcha. But basic standard and premium, or what we call managed, um, you get some, you get delete capabilities of it. You get in telemetry. You get the ACR build. We'll talk about a bunch of things related to that. But if you look at uh, scrolling up or down, depending on Mac or Windows, it's always yes. oh yeah, no uh, Windows. You, so you're scrolling the paper up. Um, you can yeah. see. Um, some of the things that you know we've got in here on the different SKUs, and like I said, the image uh, sizes is how much it comes with. There are no limits. Well, there's a five terabyte limit. If you hit five terabytes, I'd be curious. But, That's impressive. Uh, it's kind of it's just it was a safe limit. Um, and then when you're in what we call the manage the basic standard and premium, you literally just go to the portal and change it uh, when you um, from one to the other. Cool. So um, let's go back okay. to the portal. So well, for our uh, needs, we really only need basic, right? We'll, we'll start there. Yeah. All right. So click create. And there, this is a managed multi-tenant service, so it'll get out uh, pretty quick. In fact, the only thing that takes uh, a moment is the domain itself, because we actually have to set up uh, a, a traffic manager endpoint to be able to get to it. Mm. And we'll see that update in a moment. And um, I'm going to point out here in the chat room. It looks like uh, it looks like our friend Glenn Condren may have made an appearance behind you in the window there. They, oh, they've was he, they've uh, they've clipped bunny ears or something on me. I don't know, but they they <laughs> clipped some video of him appearing there. Thank you, Ellie, for grabbing that. <laughs> Glenn's awesome. So uh, anyway, so if you hit refresh, we saw it was already done. Um, so you'll have a uh, a registry there. Um, now, here's the, the fun thing that most people get tripped up with. Uh, what's... Subscriptions. They're not all selected. Why not? Show me all of them. Oh, you had everything but mine selected, I think. So there you go. Uh, there we go. There's Fritz so and Friends. Just, yeah. So when we click on that one... Okay. Um, and we'll take a quick look at the portal blade here. So you can see, and we actually need to update this donut. The donut kind of suggests that there's a max uh, amount of storage, and that really is supposed to represent your how much storage you're using as opposed to any kind of max. Um, mm, okay. Haven't gotten to that part yet. But if you look down the blade here, you can see some of the standard things for you know access control. So this is how you can give others access to your registry. Okay. Um, there's uh, rep uh, repositories. So if we click down on the services, you'll see there. And of course, we'll have nothing in it because we didn't push any images to it. This is you know somewhat equivalent to what you would get in Docker Hub to browse what your images are. Uh, some new work that we have is you'll actually be able to put uh, descriptive information like you can on a Docker Hub page. And we're also going to add it so you can put it on a tag as well. So as we push new tags to a registry, you'll be able to see what bug fixes were done in that particular image you might want to do. Oh, that's awesome. Um, we have webhooks uh, right below that. Okay. Um, and so, then... So this, uh, is, this is when I push something into my repository, you'll trigger a hook that goes off and notifies something else. 
Exactly. Oh, cool. um, in fact, we're integrating with Event Grid as well. But think of a webhook. So I might want to trigger a deployment. I might want to trigger a test. Uh, there's just a bunch of things that you might want to do as a result of a new image being pushed into a registry. Uh, we also have delete triggers as well. Mm. Um, so in fact, why don't you just hit the plus sign? We'll, we'll kind of take a, a free form navigation around here. So you can see that the actions, if you hit the drop down there, because we're not going to create one yet. We'll come back to this later. But on the actions in the middle there, you can see you can do push, delete, or both. Mm. Um, okay. Okay. So You've deleted an image. You might want to, you know, clean up some uh, release management or some testing you're doing or something. Right. Um, and then replications on the uh, right below that is where we get the fun little map. Um, so a little bit to the middle on the just below webhooks there. Oh, over uh, here. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I was looking in the same panel. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so this is where you get, you know, the global map. And uh, I don't know if you can click on that. See if you can click on that link where the orange at the top. We're, no, not yet. We realize yeah. we should just make it easier. So if you go back to the overview page, this is where it is a feature of the premium SKU. Um, so this is perfect. So if you go to update at the top there, yep. and then you can toggle that from basic to premium. So let's just flip that over to premium and, and save, click right? save. Spend in the money. And then successfully um, updated. All right. And if I go so back to replications, replications <gasps> you get you know, all these regions pretty much across the world. Okay. Uh, and we have more coming all the time. I, I'm not sure when South Africa is coming online, but we've added Australia recently. Um, uh, we've got South America. We've got you know, a number of regions in Asia. Uh, and you could see, you know, pretty much a good spattered we'll listing. Put it into Brazil. Uh, oh, my yeah, gosh. Yeah, Brazil. Um, so uh, if you want, why don't you click on one of the East U.S. there? Yeah, um, so Absolutely. We'll give that one. Get it and, local to me here. Yeah. And if you notice the URL for the registry, so um, you can just click over to the overview page now, um, and you'll see the, the registry name, and you notice that it's, you know, uh, what you call it? Oh, it uh, called it a login server, Fritz and Friends. Right. So Fritz and Friends. So notice there's no region in that. No. And that's because we, the, the geo-replication feature is something that we will just use Traffic Manager and route it to the closest registry uh, that's available for you. Okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and, and it happens dynamically, right? And including uh, if a region goes down for whatever reason, sure. Traffic Manager just route to one of the other regions that are available. Traffic Manager will just say, oh, I don't know what's going on. You're not responding. Uh, I've got these other endpoints. Let me just send it to the other endpoints. Oh, that is awesome. I, I love I, I love when I as as right somebody who's developing and just writing software I don't have to think about those operational things that now just become right it, it's it's literally a toggle switch it really is I mean and that, this is one of the things I love about uh, the container orchestrators as well and we'll we'll talk about that in a moment okay um, so why don't we uh, go now we've got the Fritz and friends so why don't you just double click Fritz and friends I I tend to like copy and paste just the Fritz and Friends part. You don't need the oh. whole after CR. Okay. So uh, copy that and then go back to your console or PowerShell, whichever you were using there. And so now we have the, uh, we want to, basically Docker is a lot of CLIs that we get to use and there's some good tooling on top of it as well. But we'll, we'll stick with some of the basics. So we want to basically log into that registry. Mm. Now, people get very focused on doing Docker login and that's great, and we actually do support Docker Login. But with Docker Login, because employees of companies tend to have two-factor auth, it doesn't have a good two-factor auth uh, solution. So what we've done is, is AC, Docker Login basically stashes things in a uh, config, a Docker config file for us, okay. including in uh, the WinCred store for secured credentials. With the AZ CLI, we can actually use your individual credential to log into the registry. Now, and this it, is the thing that people get tripped over the most. So the AZ CLI, that's the Azure command line interface. Correct. Okay. So um, just I, 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 if people aren't familiar with it, they just can look up uh, Azure CLI. It's Azure CLI 2.0. So it will be AZ, mm -hmm. ACR. Okay. And actually type list. 
Let's just do an easy ACR list. And so this will do is it, it's not limited on resource groups because we know that registries each are probably in their own resource group. So it would be silly for you to specify the resource group to see the list of one. Um, and assuming it's some uh, initialization. And you can see here's a bunch of registries that you happen to have access to. Uh, and that's because... Um, there it is. Yeah, and you can see yours. So what we want to do is we want to log in to that one because actually let's let's see what happens when we don't log in. Okay. The way you push an image to a registry is you name the image with the destination it wants to go to. And the way you would do that, so type Docker, Docker images again so we can see the ones that are there. And then if you type Docker tag, so we're going to re-tag okay. an image, uh, hello world, hello dash world, mm -hmm. and now call it Fritz and Friends. So type, paste that in, or with, with, as long as you're confident, you're typing. I type. <laughs> uh, <laughs> AzureCR.io. So it's the full domain name. Exactly. Okay. Um, slash. So that's that's your login URL. Right. OK. Uh, so Docker Hub has a default. They have basically built Docker I.O. into the Docker CLI. So if you don't specify one, it automatically goes there. This is how you get to your private registry. So you're going gotcha. to Docker tag it. Fritz and friends, Azure CR you know, dot I.O. slash hello dash world. Hello dash world. OK. And if you probably want to give this a version. So latest yeah. is great for demos and it's evil for everything else. So let's just call it one. We'll just call it one. Okay. So hit enter. And now if you type Docker images again, we'll see that we will have two. And the reality is those are actually the exact same image. Yeah, um, look at fact, that. They, notice the image ID. I was going to say the image ID is identical. So one's really just a pointer to the other. Exactly. Gotcha. Exactly. And it does uh, reference counting. So if you delete one, the other one is still going to be there. And if you delete the other one, the other one's still going to be there, which is a really good thing to remember when we push things to a registry and we delete some stuff and the registry doesn't free up as much as we thought it did. That's because we have uh, other images and they're pointing to those same layers. But that's a little more advanced. We'll come back to that later. All right. So now we can push this image we just tagged to your registry. All right. So I like to cheat. So hit, hit the up arrow for your Docker tag. Yeah, yeah. And then go back and delete. <laughs> you can just move the, the cursor to the left with your left arrow there. And then get rid of tag and actually get rid of hello world, the first hello world too, right? Because it was a copy paste. And now say push. And that's it. And hit enter. Now, we don't actually have, we didn't log into that registry yet. So that's why you're getting the authentication required. Now, this is where people try to figure out how do I do a Docker login to that registry? Yeah. And while you can, there is an easier way to do this because we don't, what people wind up doing is they go for this admin account we did, which I call the demo fodder account. Um, and let's just show people where it is. We might as well show okay. it. So go back to the portal. Yeah, yeah. And uh, if you go to the access keys, you'll see the admin account there. And by default, we've got it off because and, it's evil. Right, and and our Bitmask, our Azure mask, is actually hiding these values yeah, for right now. That, that's, that's cool. Uh, but those wouldn't do anything if it's disabled, right? Now, the problem with the admin account is it's a single account that actually does pull and push. So if you start using this account, then everybody that uses the account has push and pull rights and you have no idea which one of those, which people or which service is actually using this account. So yeah. it really is this, it's something we did early on and I'm still trying to get rid of it. And we just, anyway. Different. So, so can we use another form of access control to grant yes. people pull access, but not push? Exactly. Um, but let's, let's first do, uh, so you created that registry. So if you click on the access control and I am tab there, okay. we'll see that uh, you are already in that group as an owner. It cascades down. So you have owner rights on that. Um, well, okay. If you, maybe if you want to type uh, your, in, your, in the name, because if you don't want to show emails and then uh, shut the, the mask yeah, off. Yeah, let me shut the mask off briefly. Hey, look, there I am. 
right? And there's your email and everybody can start spamming you. Um, but they probably already have that anyway. So you have, uh, actually you have contributor rate, so that's right, because you're in my Thanks, industry. Steve. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's go back to the CLI. Okay. And because you have contributor rights, you can now type AZ, ACR, yep. login. And actually, I meant to put the name, sorry. Um, Don't do, so that. do that. Again, and now put the name of your registry, not the full login URL, although I think we fixed that, so if you do, it'll still work. All right, so I'll just type yep. Fritz and Friends. Yep. And now what we'll do is because... Uh, Oh, dash N, dash R. Is it dash R or dash N? I think it's dash R. For registry, I forget. I actually don't do this. All right, so try dash N. <laughs> and if that's, a, we should probably just look at the help. Maybe. Maybe this one went. Yeah, this one works. Taking a moment. So what we're doing here is we're taking your AZ credential uh, that you've already logged in, and we take that token and we stick the token in the Docker config uh, entry. And oh, it's in okay. Progress. So when you're now doing your Docker push, so hit the up arrow now to do your Docker push again. And now when you do that, it'll work fine because you have uh, contributor rights to that registry. Uh. And when Docker sends that token up to us, because the way we've implemented ACR is to go back and do an AD callback. So there you go. Okay, and to make sure folks understand the acronym ACR, Azure Container Azure Registry. Azure Container Registry. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Okay, so we've got that basics, and uh, so now people can at least log in. You can do push, and you can actually grant other individuals that same rights. So um, I would have uh, right. I'm probably have that rights to that as well because would, I think that's the one that's in my subscription. Um, now, if you need to do a service account, then we want to use service principles. That's what service principles are designed for. It gives you that granular access. Uh, in fact, let me give you a, a page which uh, will have, um, where did I put that? Uh, give me a second. Oh, I know it. I put it in my, uh, my deck, but it's okay. Um, go to, uh, you know what? I've just noticed the time. Let's, let's come out of that. So you have normal contributor uh, owner and reader rights. So if you gave somebody reader rights only, mm -hmm. then they would be able to pull images, but they wouldn't be able to push. Sure. That, that makes sense. So in your cluster or any place you're doing deployments, you would really only want reader rights. So if somebody gets those credentials, they can only pull images. They can't actually push. Uh, and Docker is actually interesting because I can repush images with the same tag, which... Mm is a feature that customers have asked us to disable, and we'll, we'll probably do that. Yeah. It's bad. Um, and I'm noticing the time, but we'll see if we actually get to some more demos or we'll have to do another day to drill in deeper. But I could see um, pushing with the latest tag, and you want to overlay that latest tag pointer. In some cases, for demo fodder, perfect to use latest. Like if I'm just trying to run Hello World, I don't want to guess what build ID I want to use for that. I just want to say Hello World. Yes. If I want to run... You know, a Hello World web page, same kind of thing. If I want to build an image that's based on 2.1 of the .NET framework, I want to get the 2.1 image. But I also want to know that when the .NET team updates that 2.1 image with the latest security patches, I don't have to figure out the other, the next build ID. They, in that case, are going to update 2.1 tag with newer content. Gotcha. Okay. Makes sense? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we did our basic Docker push. We talked a little bit about auth. Um, we're pretty far in, although we had a little bit of a late start. Let's kind of okay. do something a little more interesting here. Um, let's talk about how we can deploy things to um, uh, to Azure okay. and how we can use things like ACR build um, to be able to build these images, including those base image updates that I was just kind of alluding to. Um, so let me take a look at something here. Uh, actually, you know what? What's probably best is I actually do a couple of slides here to kind of talk about why some of the, put some context on the next level of this. All right. So, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to cut back to just me for a second. Okay. Uh, that. And go over there. All right. Go ahead and, and change your, so you're sharing screens. 
Okay. And I'm going to make sure that's all. Yes. Oh my gosh, I am. You are awesome. It's working. The only thing is that the, for some reason, the advertisements, the logos down at the bottom got all resized funny. So I've got to resize that. It's, it's, it's in the bottom corner, of course. Oh, I see. It's like, I can't. There's Julie. Yeah. All right. There we go. Yeah, all my stuff got moved around somehow. And there's no way back from it. All right, here we go. Container orchestration. Ooh, so yeah. here's the thing that I really love around containers. You know, in VM world, and I remember when I was working with Microsoft and I was a partner, they would ask us, hey, you know, because we'd work with them earlier on, how long have your VMs been running? Can you tell us? Because, you know, there's Windows working on reliability and VMs and so forth. And they wanted to measure that a single image was, a single VM was running for like months on time without a mm. reboot or anything. Containers, we don't care about how long they run. We assume they're going to fail. We care how fast they start up. And what's interesting is, and this is kind of like, I like to have some fun with this. You know, if you're walking down the street, everybody's got a little place like this where if you're buried in your phone, like far too many people are, you're going to trip over it and not realize that because you're probably just <laughs> kind of walking around as normal. Who did you get to get their picture taken falling <laughs> on their face? <laughs> no, you can try to make oh. it look good, right? Oh, so, that's like, terrible. She's actually playing bongos. That, that, she's going to just, this, this is how to make it look good. But she still fell. <laughs> so, you know, this, the, the, which I hear that. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. If we look, if, now, one way to think about this, what I used to kind of talk about was if you just walk with your feet a little higher all the time, it won't matter. You don't have to worry about suing the person for the reality that the, we like trees around and, and sidewalks wind up lifting and things. We know that software can fail. Yes. It will fail. Now, if you look at any system that's out there, the way they get reliability isn't they make the one thing work all the time. Reliability and full uptime is all a facade, right? We put things in front of things that when things fail, other things fall into their place. And you see NASA do this with rockets and backups, and we all have UPSs to back up the power from, you know, from our uh, utility provider and so on and so forth. What I like around the container space and especially orchestrators is they are designed for the first time with the assumption the infrastructure deals with failure. Ah, right? okay, okay. We used to have to write these load balancer routines that if the app fails, you know, switch over to another, but the machine is still running, and we got to figure out how to orchestrate all of these, manually orchestrate these things. In a container orchestrator, let's take a look at some, you know, a, a scenario here. So I'm going to build these three components of an app. There's a web front end, there's a quote service, and there's this important part of the service. This is something uh, Glenn and I did uh, a couple of months ago for the build event. So they get built and they get pushed to a container registry. It doesn't really matter who. And even here I, I abstracted, it doesn't matter if it's Kubernetes or anything else. So the container registry has those elements. And now I have this release management that tells the orchestrator, hey, can you run three copies of quotes and web and four copies of the important thing? And it goes, okay, I've got it. I am ready to run those things. And it will then go out to some pool of resources and allocate those things to be running. And okay. now I've got a couple of copies of them running. And I don't even need to know how many hosts are running. I just know that there's a, a load balancer in here and it is taking care of these things running. Now, it's Friday night. I go home, I might go out with some friends, I might go drinking, I might play poker, I might go to my kid's baseball game. I might do all of the above, um, and stuff happens. And through the night, something died, but the orchestrator was told it needed to keep these things up. So I wake up in a super the next morning, and I don't need to know from anything because the orchestrator kept those things running. Mm. It said it died. I, have, I was told what I need to keep running. It will create another node and reallocate the workload to those additional ones. 
And because I keep at least two of them, some would argue at least three, uh, of these things running, then my service is always running and can serve people. That right there is the premise of what container orchestration does, is it it assumes failure and knows how to self-heal. Very so cool. That's, just pretty cool yeah now I, um, i've got to point out the folks in the chat room are are they're enjoying your animations here they like your powerpoint foo steve <laughs> okay very cool i i do have fun i, I am a very visual person oh, uh, yeah. my specs are usually powerpoints and animation and we keep on trying to get the powerpoint compiler and we're not quite there yet uh, <laughs> and all of these are on my my blog uh my uh my uh GitHub site. I have a GitHub slash presentation, so you can get all this fun stuff. Cool. There's, the, wait, there's lots more. <laughs> uh, so, but the thing that you have to think about is all those apps, and this is where people that do the lift and shift and the and they take those existing apps that were built to run on machines that were just massive machines, and they would pump all these things into them to make sure that they stayed reliable, including redundant power supplies and you know so on and so forth and disk rates. Now we're saying is, no, that's not actually not the case. These things could fail at any time. I can do a Windows update. I can do a Linux update, whatever, um, and have my nodes moved around. The trick here is you need to make sure that your apps also deal with failure as a reality. right? When an app spins back up, it needs to know how it can reconnect to the database and pick up where yeah. the work was left off. If you're midpoint of processing uh, a batch of credit card transactions that you're trying to post back to the accounting system, you don't want to repost the same ones. You want to keep track of all the ones that were done and you pick up where that was left off. Um, a, a great old friend, Pat Helen, um, did this great you know, uh, set of uh, conversations on um, item potency uh, and so forth. And it's just really a matter of um, I should be able to play back the same transactions. And if I ask you to do something, you shouldn't come back and say, I already did it. Why are you nagging me? You just say, okay. Just do it. Right? They just do it. You've, and if I ask you to do the same thing again, you know, as, as humans, we get annoyed. As computers, it just says you give back the same answer that for what was previously done. So that's a, a great pattern. Um, so anyway, that's kind of the premise of it. Uh, we talked about, oh, we were doing authentication. So I was putting some context into uh, authentication and why we want these services and these things running. Um, so here was a little bit of uh, the ACR stuff. So you do the AZ ACR login, uh, dash N um, is for the registry name, and then you can do your push pull. And then for headless, we use service principles. And maybe for the sake of time, um, we won't go through this because if we go to our docs here, aka.ms slash ACR slash docs, so you're starting to see the pattern of what we do here. Um, under how-to guides, there's authentication, and we walk through all the different scenarios um, for creating a registry. Uh, sorry, that was quick starts. Where did I go with authentication? Tutorials, concepts. Wait, where is it? Uh, two guides. Oh, authentication. There it is. Sorry. Um, so, how to authenticate using login for your individual login, creating Surface principles, and you can set permissions on how to do it. And here's the big warning around why you shouldn't use the admin account. Um, now, what's really nice about this is you can go into the portal, like I said, and you can set up. Uh, we'll just take a look at mine here for a second. Uh, oh, this is the app service. We'll take a look at. Actually, we can take a look at. Uh, it doesn't matter. Oh, wait. Oh, da, 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 da. Um, you didn't say anything. Um, that uh, we can set up access controls, and I will have a bunch here that actually only have read operations. And I'll have a bunch of apps um, for various things. So here's an app um, uh, that has a, a limited set of permissions to it. Um, uh, I clicked into the IM uh, capability. So that's, that's kind of the main thing that I wanted to show people is that they could actually use service principles for the headless scenarios. And you can give them read-only rights. Um, and then you use, uh, for your build system, you would give it contributor rights or a new role we're going to create called push. 
uh, so that you can actually uh, go further um, with permissions as well. Make sense? Makes complete sense. Okay. So so we have ways to set up other folks so they have permissions and even, like you said, service principles, those service accounts, so folks know how to get in and and be able to build and deploy. Particularly, I'm thinking continuous deployment scenarios. Exactly. After I do a build, deploy it out to the QA area. So um, let's. How, how do you want to do time here? Because I know you're trying to get back on schedule. So you are do? the last presenter of the day, Steve. We've got all night. <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily I am on the West Coast, so I still have a bit of time. On, uh... We've got all afternoon. <laughs> Well, let's go a little bit more just because there's some interesting stuff that uh, you know, uh, we wanted to talk about. So one of the things, um, as we start working with the CLI, there's a nice little default here so you don't have to keep on typing uh, Fritz and Friends or whatever the name. You mm. can just say easy configure dash dash defaults, ACR demo, ACR equals whatever your registry name is. That Okay. Yeah, um, that saves time. Yeah. Oh, and here's their roles and permissions I was talking about. So okay. this is the map. This is a, a doc that we'll publish out soon because these two, these four uh, permission roles are new. We haven't finished pushing them out, but we basically had requests from people that they want pull rights from a node, but they should not have Azure Resource Management access. So it can't actually like list the registries, for instance. Mm. So when you said AZACR list, that is ARM level access the new pull permissions and push permissions will not be able to create or delete uh, registries. They'll not be able to list registries or do anything like that. They'll literally just be push and pull. So we'll have that come out uh, fairly soon. Very cool. We're adding image signing. Uh, so you'll be able to do content trust. Uh, that's uh, in flight as we speak. The role's actually there. Um, if you ask us, we can turn it on. We're just rolling out some stuff in the portal so that you could turn that policy on. And we have this other cool thing we call quarantine, which is how we uh, uh, secure a registry from having things that have not been scanned and secured from being pulled. And that's still in a, a preview state. So we'll, we'll skip that. But that's just some of the roles and permissions. Awesome. Um, All right. The, life cycle. Yeah. Yeah. So here's the interesting thing that you want to put some context to containers. And this is, as you see on the right, Azure is by far the cloud that's adopted containers the most. Um, what we're doing here is we really get into the point where it's not a matter of which service, you know, I, I get a lot of questions of, um, you have too many places to run containers in Azure and that's a problem. You should make it simple. Well, I, yes, there's places we probably could. Um, but if you invert the problem, and say that containers are just a great way for me to package my app and all its dependencies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Then don't I need that for everything I deploy? Mm. Right? Wouldn't it be nice if I could run my code in AKS? We'll start with that to the top or con you know, the uh, container service, which could be, should be the Kubernetes service. I just noticed that it, it needs to be updated. Um, I could run four different versions of Java, four different versions of .NET, .NET Core, different dependencies. I can run a pre-release version of .NET Core that Glenn handed me privately on a USB stick, mm. right? And because sure. I'm putting that all in my own image, it has complete isolation from everything else. I don't have to worry about it's installed on the machine, whatever that means these days. And the same thing with any registry configurations or apt get packages I need to install. Um, I might want to have different versions of the OS because I really want to minimize the footprint I have to not have anything but what I need on there. So I'm not subject to vulnerabilities that really shouldn't impact me. Yeah. Okay. Now, so it, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say there's a question here in the chat room. Um, Azure has more container usage than Google Cloud? I didn't say usage. Oh. I said more abilities to run containers. More abilities, so if look, okay. If you look at what we're doing with Azure and look at the list of services here, right? If you're running IoT, you can run containers. Azure Batch. Uh, functions, we haven't fully integrated that. I didn't get a chance to watch the whole previous uh, session. Um, but Service Fabric, App Services, obviously container instances and container services. These are all ways that you can actually deploy your code to Azure, and it's that's the packaging format. So that, so now you're making a choice over these services, not because 
uh, which one runs containers, but which one gives me the capabilities I want. Mm. If I want to take the values of Service Fabricate because of the great reliable collections and the, you know, the persistent uh, storage that it has, great. You can package your app into a container and deploy it to Service Fabric. If you want to leverage app services because I want to run, you know, a, a version of Node or a version of .NET or Java or Rust, and I want, and it doesn't need to know around those runtimes, you can give it a container and you just tell it what port to listen on. So that's the beauty of containers, and that's where I think in Azure we have done a great job and are continuing to do this. Um, as we run and give customers a chance to submit their workloads. So I really look at containers as being that packaging format. Um, so customers should, you know, developers should definitely get comfortable with Docker files and how do they build things. And then how they deploy them, pick the service that makes sense for you. Yeah, what makes you happy? What, what, yes. how, how do you need to run things? And container support is there. Exactly. Um, so I, I'm not sure if that covered the question you had over there. Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. So when I think about this lifecycle stuff, we have what we call the inner loop. And we think of inner loop as being pre-check-in. And my from statement, in fact, let's just flip over here to a Docker file. Which one do I have here? Uh, yes, yeah, so this is my ACR Hello World. So um, this one is a fairly uh, straightforward one. It's just you know from ASP.NET Core. Okay. Oh, this this is uh, an old demo we did here a while ago. Um, and then what I'm going to do, uh, sorry, that's the base. We did some interesting things. Like, think of this as the base that I want and anything that I want deployed in my production environment I'm going to put here. For instance, I use this little environment variable that I referenced later on. Okay. Now with .NET, it's a compiled language. So I want to be able to take the binary output of that. I don't want to ship the SDK, right? Because the SDK has additional surface area and that for attack surface as well as size. Sure. So I am taking the SDK image here that has everything, all the compilate compilers and everything, so that I can actually do .NET build. So you don't ship your CS files, your C sharp files, your VB exactly. files, whatever files it is, F sharp files that you may be delivering. You know, jars, you know, all the, well, not jars, but the, you know, the Java files. Oh, yeah. Um, so now, <clears throat> excuse me, after I've done my build and my compilation, now I'm going to have a, an image that I want to publish. And notice um, from build as publish, this is the thing that I'm actually going to do .NET publish in. And the reason we did this is because I want to be able to put unit tests in here. So I might do uh, from publish as test. And for the sake of time, we're going to skip this here. Stop helping me. And yeah, publish, you misspelled publish. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to actually use this. Okay. Uh, run .NET test. So now I can actually do my testing in here. And only if my unit tests succeed will my image continue. Oh, oh that's awesome. Right? So that's just why this, these two are split up. And then I say from base this thing at the top, as final, as production, I'm going to copy the published output from the publish image, right? Yep, yep. Copy that to the app uh, from the app directory in the publish image to the working directory that is .app, and then I make my entry point. So now my runtime image, the thing I'm going to ship, literally only has my app and the base OS. It doesn't have the .NET SDK. It doesn't have any of the NuGet packages I don't need, um, all of that kind of fun stuff. So awesome. when, I think, when I think about this inner loop, that's the stuff that I'm authoring, right? I'm doing a from statement, and I'm testing this. Inner loop. It's not necessarily on my local machine. In a loop, might be in the cloud. We have things like Dev Spaces that are really and Draft that are helping developers actually iterate their code in the cloud before they get commit. And that itself is a whole nother talk that we'll see if we can get Lisa or John to come talk about that. Yep, Lisa is interested in joining us. We'll probably have her tune in and join us uh, in a week or two here and make that uh, discussion happen. Sweet. So then you're committing your source. 
Oh, actually, this is a different thing. Uh, sorry, different animation. So um, these are the lifecycle primitives, right? So you want to have a registry secured by default. This okay. is this quarantine pattern that we're talking about. Yep. Um, it's an OSS contribution we've been working on with Aqua and Twistlock and uh, Nuo Vector. Uh, there are some great vulnerability scanning products. You're going to have a last line of defense where you're still protecting those. You're going to have a way to build your images. We do this natively in ACR so you can build your images right next to the registry. And uh, what you can also get is we'll talk about base image updates for OS and framework patching. Oh, very cool. Yeah. It's the, anyway, we'll come back to that. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, but what's nice about that is the same way you did a Docker build locally, I can do an ACR build remotely as well. So I basically say AZ ACR build. It'll take my local directory that I've been iterating on, but it can actually build it in Azure, in, in ACR. Yeah. And then with the webhook, because we automatically push, with a webhook, you can have it automatically deployed to, let's say, some dev staging server. And we'll actually do that, if depending on time here. Yeah. yeah. Um, you might have something like Helm for doing your uh, deployments. Um, we're going to be adding uh, Helm repos to ACR. Uh, so that's kind of uh, will help. And we have some auto purge capabilities we're adding to registries. So it turns out that customers that automate things tend to fill up registries very quickly. I bet. Um, <laughs> I like to say that people have like 99.9% .9 of all the images in a registry never see the light of day. Uh, because they're just building and automating and building and automating. So we're working on a feature that will help them keep track of what they've released and what's actually released and keep those for a longer period of time. Yeah. And the things that are uh, built that never done anything with, those you might delete in a week, a, week, a day, whatever you decide. Uh, and the things that failed vulnerability scanning, you might delete those in an hour. So we'll, we have this feature working. we're working on. We'll have it out uh, this fall is our plan. Now, what's interesting is what happens when your code stops being contributed? Uh, you actually, at some point, probably get to a point where you're not actually making code changes, but the app is still running in production, you would hope. Um, that's kind of the goal is to get on to the next project. Uh, with containers, the way you patch containers is not run, go to the running containers everywhere in your deployment and run, you know, app get update on each one of them or Windows Update. <laughs> yeah, or Windows. Uh, it's Patch Tuesday. Go, no, yeah, don't do that. Yeah, go find your thousands of instances. Uh, what we want to do is take those updates as they come in, rebuild those images, send out some events, and let the build and test automation you've set up validate and do a new release. Because what's the problem that most people do when they have uh, uh, automated patching in their VMs? Somebody patches the VM and the app stops working because it's not practical to test. So uh, what's really cool about this pattern, the developers that keep on putting off tests because they're almost done with the project actually get value because now we're going to use that build and release pipeline for the life of the app. Oh, so that sounds very, very VSTS, right? I want to, I want to automate the entire process, and for the life of it, then yes, go do exactly. that rebuild, retest, and then redeploy it into the orchestrator. Exactly. Um, so we'll talk about how we have those capabilities in ACR build to track those base image updates, and then you can use. In fact, I think it's the. Well, hold on, let me. It's one of my slides here. Where is that? Uh, actually, I have a whole section on ACR build. So um, let's actually talk about that, and we'll. Um, actually, let's just do some demos here. So uh, where was I? Uh, let's go. To, actually, I've got it in VS Code here. We like our little terminal window. So here, whoops, not clear there. Let's clear here. So if we look at um, this app, right? This was the a ACR Hello World app. Yeah. Uh, I think this is the one that um, we... Are, where are we? Is it, yeah, basically it's this one. I actually use this for geo-replication. So this is actually deployed to app service here. Um, and it's basically just, you can see the index HTML. There's just some stuff in here that which kept it pretty minimal. Um, and you can see we, we spit out some view data uh, for the registry URL, the IP, and the region. And we'll, this is, comes from that... Uh, 
uh, environment variable we referenced before. Okay. Now, instead of having Docker locally, what I can do is, uh, let's see what, oops. Make sure I'm in the right directory, yep. Um, so now what I can do is type azacr build, and if we look close at this command, um, let's take a look here. So it, what I'm doing is azacr build. I could have typed docker build. I was gonna say, it looks very much like a, the docker command. Exactly. And it just happens to be the same characters. So that's actually kind of cool, too. Um, now I give it a tag, a, right? And I'm tagging it geo replication uh, demo. And I've actually giving it a single tag called release. This is the uh, stuff with app service because it only knows how to do a single tag at this point. But I also want to have a unique ID because, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, when I, for stability. Because when that cluster goes down and it wants to pull a new image, I want to make sure I'm pulling the exact same image that was already deployed on the other nodes. And if you're using stable tags for release, you can get some interesting uh, problems. And um, in fact, let's actually use the other one that I've got here. We're going to switch this other one for this hello world here. And I'll show why in a moment. This one happens to be node. Um, so we'll, that doesn't really matter. And why did, what did failed here? Let me just take a look at something, make sure. Oh, I know what this is. That was something else. Okay, PWD, so let's go back up to our hello world uh, directory. So this one is a node app. Um, I have a very simple file in here that actually just spits some stuff out and we'll look at this in a moment. So I can say az, acr, build, dash t, <coughs> Uh, demo 42, well, actually, let me go back and see. I don't remember the tag that I had in here. So this is a good thing to look in the portal. So we'll come over to the portal, and we're going to look. That's our geo-replication demo. We have to look at Kubernetes. Um, so we're going to do, oops, we're not going to do that. Let's take a look at, uh, and I'm purposely not drilling into Kubernetes just yet because it's in itself a whole other conversation. Oh, yes. uh, but I want to just pull out um, the tag that I'm currently deploying out here because I actually am running um, unique tags in deployment. And if we look at the page, where is that one running? That one is running, here it is. So, oh, and Kubernetes, of course, comes up right there. So this is the page that we're editing right now. So it just says enable OS and framework patching, ACR build, and we'll stick something in here. Okay. If we look over here, we could see our hello world image. And if we look, actually we can see right there, that is uh, the uh, registry. Uh, but if I wanna get the entire tag, um, I'll just go in here for a moment. Now if we look, Demo42, Azure CR.io, and then I just put a sub namespace and I've got that on there. Okay. And if we look at this guy, there's only one right now. So, and if we look at this one, our background is white, right? Sure. Yeah. I'm going to mess with this a little bit. We're going to say tag it, the same tag that's deployed. Okay. I'm going to give it a second tag also. Dot build dot ID. And what that is, is it'll actually, ACR build has build IDs, and I'm just going to stick that in there. Unfortunately, PowerShell doesn't really like the, um, uh, the curly brackets, so we'll stick that in quotes. Um, because the Docker file is in the root, I don't need to specify the Docker file, and I can just say, take the local directory. And as a result, just like Docker build, we'll send it to a Docker host. ACR build is doing the exact same thing, except that I was messing with something. Hold on. So remember that AZ configure command I told you about? Yes. AZ configure dash dash defaults. <laughs> ACR equals demo 42, not demo 43. Notice that right there. Um, so we'll run that again. And we'll let that, uh, so now it's make, getting, it's got, it's queued to build, 
Uh, it's AABN is the build ID. It's waiting for an agent in that pool, and it'll start streaming this thing out um, as it's actually doing the build. Now, if we look now, let's go back to this page, right? As I'm refreshing it, I've got one instance, so I'm. it's always the same one, not a big deal. Right. Um, as this thing starts to stream its logs, and notice it's doing the exact same thing, including color, that you would get from Docker build locally. Yeah. We're doing the yeah. same thing with CR. Um, and we'll see here for a second, um, it's just getting ready to push the last delta layer. Um, see, layers already exist. It knows that... Uh, uh, well, so this is uh, another part of our containers is unlike a VHD that has this monstrous one VHD, which you could play games with, Docker inherently has this layered file system. So if the only thing you've changed is the code at the top, you don't need to worry about the NuGet packages, your um, uh, any other packages that you have, your base image from the OS. It says that didn't change. I don't need to push that. I'm only going to push this last couple of megs uh, of what I sent up. Now, if we look a little closer at this output, ACR build gave us a little extra. So let's close some of these windows here. <coughs> if we notice, ACR builder discovered the following dependencies. This is the image we built, AAB7. And if we notice, it also says, here's your runtime dependency. It is based on the node image, node I, nine, uh, nine alpine, it actually mm -hmm. comes from my registry because I want to be able to change this in a moment. And it also has a runtime dependency uh, of no, – uh, wait, did I – what did I say? Oh, I'm sorry. I was getting – if it was a .NET Framework app, you would see a build time dependency. Because Node is dynamic, it doesn't need an SDK. It doesn't need you know uh, a separate image to be built. Right. Makes sense. So now I have this runtime dependency here. So now if we come over here – and I go to my hello world, and we scale it up. Oh, wait, I didn't make a change. That was the hard part. Sorry, hold on a second. We need to go back to our Docker file and actually make a subtle change here. Right, um, you wanted to pass in a value or something. Well, let's just do this. So, hello, Fritz and friends. Cool. And, and uh, we'll run that again. Did I do something wrong? Uh, the ampersand there, it's going to write that's a... Aren't you going to run into a, uh, a HTML entity issue there? I don't know, but I'm going to do it this way because I don't feel like messing with it right now. There you go. That's not, proving things could fail is not exactly the thing I'm trying to do right at this point. Um, so we'll send that back up again. Uh, we'll let that build. Um, I'm not going to scale this yet because if, what, if we scale it now, if you remember, AKS, our orchestrator, is looking to deploy uh, – hold on. So this is the one fun part of this. <coughs> you do have to uh, rebrowse every once in a while to get AKS up. Mm. So just keep it in your history. You just hit the up arrow. And away you go. And we'll go to our deployments. And if we look, we can see, right? This is what it's told to run. Okay. So when I want to tell it to scale, it's going to pull another one of those images out, right? So it's almost finished here. We'll let that finish up. See, it says which repository it's referring to. And one of the nice things with ACR build is because we know what registry you're defaulted to, because you normally have to pass in the dash uh, R, and but we've put it in the configure. You don't need to do you know all of this goo for the login name. We automatically append that oh, or prepend that to your images. Oh, my gosh. That'd be yes. a pain in the neck. Yeah. Okay. So now that new one's up there. So now when we go here and scale it and we say, let's get three of them running. And now Kubernetes is going, hey, I'm told I've got to run three of these things. You can see it's automatically starting its deployment. 
So there's right. a, there's a comment in the chat round chat room about using the Kubernetes user interface. We want to make sure this is easy for folks to learn and follow before we go and and start getting you know yeah more like I said, the command Kubernetes line focused. Thing is a whole uh, a whole another conversation here. What I'm really trying to show is the idea of why you want unique tags. So as I start refreshing this, notice what I usually would change the background. But notice only some of my containers actually have this Have the update. Because <coughs> I didn't actually officially move out an update. Ah. Right? I didn't actually tell Kubernetes I want to roll out an update. I updated a tag of an existing tag. So all the cluster did was <clears throat> either fail or scale. And it accidentally pulled an update because we used the same tag. So that's one of the reasons why we don't want to use uh, stable tags for deployment. So I like to joke, stable tags create instability. Huh. You want stable tags in your from statement because now what we'll do, let's take a look at one other thing here. So we talked about base image updates. So in this case, uh, this one is based on that node 9 Alpine image that I happen to have in my registry. Right. If I come over here, let's bring up the cloud shell. Do I still have it? I'll sign in. Yep, that's me. And I just I like this because Bash gives me a nice the the watch command that I can just have it automatically update. I'll just let that Excuse refresh. Me. And just let that finish connecting, blah, blah, blah. Uh, okay. Does Azure have Kubernetes Federation support? Um, I don't remember if they've got that done yet. Okay. So um, that'd be a great question for Justin or Sean McKenna. Uh, list builds. Okay. So now what I'm doing is I'm watching all the builds that have been done. If we notice, this is the one we just did. Um, the task, there's something called build tasks, which we'll, we'll show in a minute. But there's no task name. It's what we call a quick build. Mm, okay. So I manually, it was a manual trigger. Now, if I come over and uh, let's, I'll do this over here. So AZ ACR uh, build task list. What you'll see is I have a bunch of build tasks that I've already set up. That would be an interesting way this displays. Yeah, uh, well, we kind of go like this. So I've created these build tasks. So instead of being you know, on the fly, AZ ACR build, I can say AZ, AZ ACR build task create, and then I can pass in all of it, including my personal access token for my Git repo. And as my git commits are made, the build will get triggered. That's behind me. One second here. I'm going to hide. Oh, sorry. There Maybe. we go. Now it's easier for folks to see. Uh, terminate job, yes. There we go. Um, so I'm creating these build tasks. And I, I feel like I am rushing. I probably underestimated the amount of time this stuff takes to, to, as we're chatting. Uh, because I've created that build task, mm -hmm. In addition to a git commit, so let's go back over here and we will commit this little change we made. So we'll say to our hello world app, hey Fritz and friends, because we know this is good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We can we have that committed, um, and that's good. Uh, actually, we need to actually fully commit it. So now, as that's running. We'll see this is going, once that little squirrely bar goes back faster, because it was a really big file change. Come on. Uh, we'll see that. Oh, that, look at that. Right? It's automatically committed. No big deal, right? I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say, like, woo, we have git commit triggers, wonderful. That's not the interesting thing. That's the thing you would just expect to happen. Sure. But wait, there's more. Um, if I come over to... Where do I have my Git repo? Oh, we come over to demo 42, and we go to our base image node here. 
And we change our Docker file here. And we're going to say this one is now blue. And we'll change this to say blue. Right? We set our background color to blue. So imagine the uh, your base OS, your base framework, whatever it is, mm -hmm. has made a change that you weren't expecting. God forbid. Um, we want to be able to check for that and test. So here, this is why testing is still critically important. So right now, my base image uh, is for Node is was triggered by a git commit, just like my other one was, right? Right. Just what I would expect. But watch here in a moment. Once this finishes, what we're going to see is because the this image, uh, the demo 42 hello world, knows it's based on the output of this image, ACR build is tracking that uh, from statement, that image that you had in your from statement, and whenever that image gets updated, we will automatically trigger that build. So notice this hello world one is now building again, not because of a git commit, it's because the, and we see the trigger here, it says base image update or image update. Okay, so this is this is a feature I get for free by adding a container image into ACR, into the Azure Container Registry. This is what you get by creating a build task in ACR. Okay. okay. So you're basically saying, hey, ACR, not only store my images, but build and maintain those for me as well. And it, as Nava, St Nava Styles is saying here in the chat room, it monitors the dependency, and if it sees any of those dependencies change, fires another build. Um, so there's two aspects of that. Dependencies is an interesting, we, we're, we've been talking about how we can expand this. Today, we're tracking the uh, images we see in your Docker file. We, we are trying to hold a line in ACR, in the ACR build capabilities, that we are lang completely language agnostic. We know nothing about what it is. If you can put it in a Docker file and build it, we're just going to build it. Yeah, and we're sure. building this massively scalable um, build system in Azure because, as you can imagine, as containers become the standard unit of deployment, and that's the way you patch containers as you rebuild, we need this massively scaling system because when .NET ships, when Node ships, when Alpine ships, when Patch Tuesday for Windows, any of those things happen, think about how many builds are going to kick off oh. Im immediately. Oh. Right? So that's Huge. the kind of infrastructure we're building uh, as part of I actually have this fun little animation that I like showing because I'm all about animations. Uh, there's this one. Um, so today... We have the Contoso returns app. And okay. one pull request is a build, a push, probably a scan, and you would test it and deploy. But it's really just for the life of the app. Once development stops, you know, you typically don't think about rebuilding anything anymore. You just let ops deal with it. They're gonna patch the machines. I'm I'm gonna go on to the next project, go on vacation, whatever. Sure. In the container world, because we rebuild and retest the containers. All the apps at Contoso, all the apps at Northwind, and all the other companies that we've ever created at Microsoft, including the real ones, <laughs> right? We're tracking those base image updates, whether they come from Docker Hub or the Microsoft Container Registry or eventually other registries if we feel we need to index those. As those base images come in, we're going to trigger, um, and we're working on some event grid integration. We do this all in ACR today. And every one of those builds on every one of those machines will trigger. And it's for the life of the app. So mm. that's just, you know, that's a fun scalability project to, to take oh on. Oh, my gosh, yes. So um, anyway, so that's done. And unfortunately, my, my CD is not working. So I'm going to have to manually tweak this here. So assuming this is still running. No, it's not. Of course not. So we'll do that. Um, so all I need to do is just I want to go test, tell um, Kubernetes to deploy the new tag because we always deploy unique tags. And I'm just going to hack that into uh, the update there. So we'll go our deployments, our hello worlds. I could do this with a Helm chart as well, but um, it's just for now it's a little easier to do it this way. So I just update that. And now my image was already built, right? The only thing I really did was tell it to uh, now deploy the new tag because we always want new tags. 
And what we'll see here in a moment, as I'm continually refreshing this, we will get consistency because we picked up the Fritz and Friends in mm -hmm. our committed image. But we've also got, come on, come on. You've also got the update in the base image. Yeah, so it's blue now. So now I've got the blue update that went out and my test pass, which it probably shouldn't because notice I can't even see my URL. <laughs> um, in fact, I have a unit test. I'll flip over in, in the .NET Core project to show that in a second. But think about the power there. You know, and, and as your company ships the new update that they want to have all the teams based on because your company probably has its own .NET Core uh, base image that they want to manage for their company. And they probably have their own set of build tools. As those images get updated, uh, you can tr automatically trigger all of the builds that are already set up. Uh, so that's just super powerful. And of course, you know, as Microsoft, depending on where your from statement is from, uh, you can also trigger all of those transitive builds, absolutely do tests, make sure your deployments are based on tests, don't do what I just did there. Um, and let me show you a quick example of that. Now, while you're heading over there, yeah. a question from Nava Styles in the chat room is, is Azure able to scale the machines now without making a completely new cluster? I think we just saw it didn't deploy a new cluster. It still had existing images in there, and it was, you were showing, it was updating and deploying other copies of that image before going back and, and replacing the older versions. I think the question, if I understand the question, and uh, we were deploying new containers into existing, um, uh, into an existing orchestrator, an yes. existing cluster. We weren't doing any kind of VM scale sets configurations. Okay, so if you scaled, and the, Nava Styles clarifies, if you scaled your cluster, Azure needed to spin up and down physical machines. Yes. Yes. Okay. Right. That's. The, and you'll see um, the what is it, the Kuber the Kublet the virtual Kublet stuff is that's where you're starting to see the work we're doing with ACI being the ability to automatically scale on demand without having to deal with VMs as well. Okay. Um, and so that's some really cool stuff. And you know Azure was the first to do the the um, nodeless deployments of containers. And you know when was the last time you actually went to uh, a cloud? and installed an OS on hardware. Oh gosh. Right? Like we don't do that anymore, especially no. in managed clouds. Why is it you have to go and provision a VM if you're running containers? Right. I shouldn't have so, to do that anymore. Exactly. So ACI is, you know, pioneered that uh, and we're with Virtual Kublet, we're building that into AKS and over time basically you shouldn't have to deal with the hosts at all. You may want to Right? For a long time, people still needed to get to the host OS on virtual machines until all the tools and everything gave everybody the comfort. Now we don't get to hosts anymore. Eventually, we'll be the same place with containers. Okay, right. so we talked about testing. So here's an example, and unfortunately, I broke this one. So, and if Glenn stayed instead of just making fun of me when he went by, um, we could have actually maybe fixed this one. But anyway, uh, in here, what I'm doing is I'm running .NET test. And in my test, if I remember where we put this, uh, base image test, here it was. We had this thing where we we're basically testing uh, for good, amazing, and great. I think it was, I think the test was, I was expecting good and great. And I went to the base image and I stuck in something, the .NET framework team shipped something amazing. And I was not expecting that. So my test would fail. That was, uh, the goofiness there that we kind of played with, uh, that example. Okay. Uh, and if you want to see that, that was the, the build event at, at Microsoft build, Glenn and I did a talk. Uh, where we uh, demonstrated that. Or no, okay, it was one of the two talks that I did a build. I don't know if it's the one with Glenn or not. I think it was the other one. Um, where were we? We covered so much different stuff here. So you, uh, so you were showing tests get built. They, they can stop the build is where I think you were trying to go. Um, I wasn't, uh, it wasn't so much, was it stop the build? It was more a matter of you can use base image updates. Oh, you can stop your deployment. If I'm okay. not, if my tests fail, yeah. you know, if the .NET framework ships something amazing that I wasn't expecting, I want my tests to fail and not have my release done, at least from a unit test. You also want to do functional tests. Just because the code compiled and the individual API calls worked 
you want to do um, functional testing as well. Glenn and I definitely talked about that. Basically, we think we had an example where we changed the contract between two teams. Mm -hmm. uh, bad, bad. Um, and you need to do functional testing before you roll things out as well. So there's, if anything, what I love around the container space, and especially when you think about the OS and framework patching scenarios, is um, we are getting value from those tests. It's no longer, hey, the project's almost done. I know I said this, but it's like the project's almost done. We don't have to write those tests. No, you actually want to write those tests because they're going to be used for the life of the app. And if you wrote those tests when the person tries to ship the update to the OS or something, yeah. they get caught and you can fix it be and on the next day and not come in while you're still uh, dirty from being at your kid's baseball game instead of drunk or whatever. Um, <laughs> whatever. It's probably a much better way to be saying this. Because you're really tired because you were hiking up the mountain. Um, you sure. don't actually have to run back. Uh, you can deal with it in the morning because the the patch did not get deployed. Very cool. All right. Um, we covered a lot. Co a lot. Yeah, we did. What else did I have in here? Uh, oh, the geo replication is a pretty cool demo. I'll just show that really quick. That's right. basically, I got the same app deployed in East US and West Europe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I just went to the map and clicked on it just like you did before. Yep. Um, and let's go, where is that demo? That was this one here. So ACR Hello World will go here and we will say hello, Fritz. And just, you're worried I'm going to break that. Will that break there? Mm -hmm. Fritz, hello, Fritz. And Fritz. that shouldn't. To the world, whatever. Clearly, I'm. And now, um, when I. Uh, when you rebuild? Yeah. What? Um, oh, I, I. Okay. So I have to get the tag because I don't remember what I tagged this one. So I'll come over to Azure. I'll come over to my app services. I will um, look at one of these two. We will look at the container. Container settings, and I'm going to see what my tag is. Uh, the image it's loading. Oh, it's taking so long to load. There it goes. It was that colon release. So I will say, oh, actually, I had it right here. But I showed you where all that stuff is at. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So notice I've done release and build ID. So when that gets automatically built, um, so now it's building, and if we look in a, look in that registry, so we'll go back over here to this container registry. Yes, I want to leave. And we look at demo 42, and we look at our web hooks. We'll see we've got a couple here, and it's these two that are numbered. And you'll see there, here's all the history of them because it's really nice about the way we've done the webhooks is not only can we see the request go out, but we can see the response. So mm. when you start getting errors that my deployment didn't work, if the response was an error response, you can see what was going on. So that's super cool. And you can actually set this up really simply. It's basically you go to the repositories. Uh, repositories. No, repositories, not re not replications. Everything starts with R. Yeah. And we'll just click on one of these tags. I've got a lot of images in here. <laughs> well, it oh shouldn't take so goodness. long. Yeah, this is the automation at, at best. Um, so here, actually, here's a Windows Server Core one. Um, and I, actually, let's deploy this to, let's take an LTSC. So we actually have, uh, we just shipped, um, oh, that's not what I want to click on. We just shipped Windows support and ACR build as well. Okay. And um, this was built with ACR build, and I can go deploy this. Fritz and friends. And we're going to deploy this to ACI. Uh, I think I have a delete me here. Do I have a delete me? Delete me. And we'll say go. Um, and now that is going to deploy out to ACI, which is really cool. We'll let and while that 
deployment is being done, we notice this thing was finished. If we refresh our app service, ta-da. Cool, okay. I jumped around a lot there, didn't I? So, so you deployed and you got replicated to different places. Yeah, let's let's recap that because <laughs> I realized I got a little tangent while I was. Uh, yeah, doing that. you. Sorry, I get excited bit. about this. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was trying to show how things were set up, and I just went on a on a, on a tangent there. So, what we did was we in our registry for yes, leave that for demo 42. We had already set this thing up to have geo replication. Right. Right. So we've got I've got it several on here. I had like 10 replications at one point. So we've got it from East US and West Europe. OK. And I put two app service plans in those two regions. And the reason I, I'd want to host locally. And remember, we always want our registries close to where we're deploying. OK. So once I had that set up, I went to the repositories and I had right clicked on that one. And instead of ACI, I actually deployed to app service. So where was our geo replication demo? I go to release and I say uh, deploy to web app. And I set this up here and I'm not gonna go through it again. Um, but if we notice that when we're doing this as a result of setting up the right click and because I told it what region to put it in app service location. So notice I have an East US and West Europe here. I have these two regions. Yeah. Once I set that up, when we finish this blade, we have set up a regionalized webhook for that deployment. And so we come back over to webhooks. When I finish it the first time, we see, it's, my names are a little long here. Is it this one? Uh, location East US, because that was my first one, right? Mm -hmm. So if mm -hmm. I configure this, you're going to see that the name, I can't change the name, but the URL is going out to the app service in East US. The location of the webhook, where, oh, we don't let you change the location, so we don't show it here. If I was creating a new webhook, you would see we give you location. Mm. And and we show you not all the locations we have, we show you the locations that that registry is replicated to. Okay. So now what happened was the first, because I built and pushed and I'm closer to East US, the East US one got updated first. If had we if we had caught it in time, this one would still be have the old text. It did have the old text when you when you did that, right? We can look because back on the video and see that. There you go. So it takes time to replicate, right? So, but when once it replicates, because we have a regionalized webhook here that tells the app service over in West Europe to go update itself, they are all updated as the images arrive at each location. Mm. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. So as they arrive, it deploys and updates the local app service. Cool. Exactly. All right. Exactly. Because we really want to have you know local local polls, and we want local deployments, um, and we only want it to be, it should only happen once the image gets there. Um, now the thing, the other thing that I did that I was I, I jammed in there in the middle. Right. Was, you started de uh, deploy of a Windows instance. Right. If we go to container instances. I had stuck this guy in here, and if we click on its IP address, we can see this one is a Windows Server, a version of .NET Framework that is spinning up there. Come on. Did deploy, right? Hmm. Oh, maybe it's still finished. Yeah, it's probably still finishing the deployment. Uh, FQDN. Okay, and it's still running. It's probably still doing the image pulls uh, because that's that. Maybe it's just the older image or something. Yeah, those images for Windows are gigantic. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if we do AZACR build task list, we can see how I built that. And 
AZ ACR build task run. And we'll take uh, this one right here. Hello world Windows Server Core 2016 dash N. I always forget that. And now that one, and what you'll see is the platform over here, instead of Linux, will pop in, uh, go for the build. Actually, let's go over here. And let's see, where was our cloud shell? Oh, we lost it. We have to reset that. Log in. I think having, I think I jumped ahead and stole the screen from you. If you were doing this, you would have slowed me down on my pace. <laughs> it's all right. Where is our watch coming out? There we go. Watch. And we can see now that one is running, and you can see the platform is Windows. Um, and we also support ARM as well. Uh, so if you're doing IoT uh, device builds that you need uh, ARM, you basically, it turns out you actually don't need to specify OS equals ARM. Uh, you do your uh, your from statement from a Linux, sorry, from an ARM image, yeah. and just leave it as default, and we'll automatically pick it up. Um, so that's super cool uh, for IoT scenarios. Awesome. All right. All right. Let's see if that's going to come up. It's, I don't know what's going on there. Do the deploy. We'd like to see you. No, that's the one demo that's going to fail on the... Bummer. What did I do? Did I pick the wrong? No, if I picked the wrong image, it would have told me. It said OS type. All right. Anyway, we covered a lot. We did. Uh, oh, my so, gosh, we did. Right? We, we, uh, we got from let's put everything in containers because that's a new deployment, a new <laughs> unit of deployment, to you know what? Look at how easy it is when there's a patch to rebuild those containers if you're using ACR with build tasks, right? That's tremendous to, to see and get that. And there was a comment in the chat room. It's a, it's a thundering herd problem at that point, right? When, you, when Patch Tuesday happens, we're going to check everything. And then everybody that has those build tasks wired up, is, it's just going to do a rebuild and just make it, right? Make everything more secure and redeploy in that gradual rollout pattern that we saw when you started refreshing with exactly. just the little changes to make the background blue. Okay, that's nice. But yeah, you start it, but it, if it was something more important, like, oh, you know what? We need to upgrade our TLS version in here. Ah, oh, okay, yeah. Everybody's well, going to be... what's super nice about this is, of course, you want to roll out updates, but if, if the update breaks your app, is that really the right answer? And it might be. So what's really nice about this is because... We're going to write good unit tests and good functional tests for all of our apps now. Um, when that patch comes through, if it breaks our app, we can get an alert and we can decide, no, we really do need to rush into the office and fix it. But instead of the app being broken, we actually can get this notification and actually do something about it rather than just, you know, have our apps be broken and now have two sets of problems. Great. We, yeah. we didn't get bit by the TLS bug, but now our business is down. And there are businesses that have gone out of business because uh, they had some outage for a bit. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Stock market has classic uh, examples of this. So there's, well, I don't think we want our, our I don't know, I want to pick on whatever it is that you think is critical. I, I want to pick on anyone in particular. Awesome. All right. So, uh, Anyway, I, I probably should, I, it, as you see, when you start playing with containers, they're a lot of fun um, and you can get carried away. Uh, the thing that I would probably give as some closing advice to people is containers are a paradigm shift. Sure. You're going to sure. start playing with it and you're going to go like, oh, I can use it for this and, and think you're done because we only have seven seconds of attention span on anything. <laughs> um, it takes three months for you to really get it. Uh, it happened to me. It's happened to everybody I know. I've seen some brilliant people here at Microsoft who just got started with containers, and we all went through the same journey. Mm. Um, we all thought of these great things we could do with it, and it turns out, like, oh, actually, no, that was a stupid idea. You should really just invert it completely. And I, I make it an analogy of you know driving an electric car. If anybody's been driving EV cars, if you drive an EV car like you drive a grass, gas car, and you don't charge it every night, you're going to get a rude awakening because you're not going to find a charger <laughs> uh, when you're rushing that morning that you can just pop into that quick. Yeah. But if you charge every night, you can take off from the light pretty quickly every time. And I 
you know, when was the last time you were in a, a gas station? So there, you need to learn the new model to take advantage of it. And if you do, you get all these great benefits and you know to not do things the old way. Um, and that talks about build systems. It talks about testing. Um, it talks about, you know, how I author my code and my services in the first place. Uh, I can break things up into much smaller units. Um, so anyway, I, I'm, I'm so oh, yeah. carried away with. No. So, and, so let me leave you with the, the wise words of the philosopher Walter White. <laughs> Okay. Right. It can be done exactly how I want it. The only question Wait, what was is, that? Are you the man to do it? It can be done exactly how I want it. The only question question is, are you the man to do it? Gotcha. Yeah. So, um, oh my gosh, thanks so much to, to our friends out there. Uh, we got another subscriber out there. And there's our friend uh, Chris Gomez, one of our MVPs. Thanks so much for the, uh, the emotes there. Um... That's awesome yep. stuff. Thank you thank so you much. For hanging in with us. We'll uh, thank you, Steve. We'll, we'll talk about doing some breakouts and maybe focus on a couple of the smaller ones and, and spend time on that one there. Absolutely, so, we do have we do have uh, some discussions already going to talk about uh, a a session here on Dev Spaces a little bit a uh, little bit later in the next few weeks. Um, but this has been tremendous. You know, we, the all containers is a huge topic and to try and fit it in. And I'm okay that we went over a bit here to try and fit it in, in, uh, in, in an hour is, is tough. And, uh, thanks so much for, for bringing all your knowledge, sharing these amazing slides and, and going through with those demos on Azure. It was, uh, really good to see. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. And, um, the presentations is down here on, on the right here. You can, uh, well, whatever. You GitHub Steve Lasker presentations, um, so you can uh, find any of the the slides there. And there's some other stuff around ACR and why don't yeah, we do great this? people at Azure. Why don't we Why don't we take that link, drop it to me in the in in an email or here in the chat, and um, I'll make sure it's attached to the YouTube video. So those of you that are watching this on a recording on YouTube, open up the description below me here, and you'll see the link for that presentation. Uh, repository on GitHub, so you can click through to that. Jeff, thank you for putting this together. I was, I was when you first started doing this, I was like, "Doing what?" Um, but I'm playing doing, Fortnite. Watching a Steve. couple of these, I know I, this is your cover for playing Fortnite. <laughs> uh, watching a couple of videos prepping for this and doing this with you has been a lot of fun. Cool. And I promise I will give you control and, and not uh, rush through things next time. So not thank no you problem. All righty. Thanks so much, you. Steve. We'll catch you Bye. later. All right. And we're out. Oh my gosh. So much stuff there. This has been a tremendous day. Thank you everybody who's tuned in, who's been here for any part of the day. For those of you watching the recordings, whether it's on YouTube or it's on Twitch, thanks so much for for tuning in, for joining us for any part of this. If you're watching here on the live video right now, thank you so much for the follows, for the subscriptions. Um, this is something I do three, four times a week. Um, 10 a.m. East Coast time. Um, feel free to, to click that follow button, tune in. We write code together uh, for a, a good bit of the time. I've got a bunch of guests lined up here for over the next few weeks. Friends like Brad Wilson from XUnit and Oren Novotny is going to join us again and talk a little bit about DevOps. Glenn Block is going to join us, and he's really excited to talk to us about API management. And our friend Iris Class, and if you think back, if you look back to our very first video we did together on stream, that was with Iris, and we talked about building various algorithms and things. And we didn't, we didn't get too far into code, but we had a good time chatting with Iris. And this has been, yes, Andres, this has been eight hours, an eight-hour-long workshop. We covered a ton of content. I encourage you, check out the videos. There's going to be recordings out there. I want you to, to check out the clips that some of our friends have, have made here. Um, I've got a bunch of links that I'm attaching to all the videos. I'm going to break this out into eight one-hour videos. There will be a, a playlist that you'll be able you'll be able to find on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash C Sharp Fritz. Um, I hope everybody had a great time with, with this set of videos. 
I absolutely love sharing all of this great content with you, with you viewers, um, with our pair programmers that have joined us today. I want to make sure that I thank everybody. Uh, Steve Smith, Julie Lerman, Jimmy Bogard, uh, Miguel Castro, Mark Miller, right? Um, gosh, Cecil Phillip, and of course, Steve Lasker there at the end. Um, if you enjoyed this content, let your friends know. Send them a link. Share this around. Put, share it out there to link, LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter. Let us know how we're doing. Um, we're going to be doing more of these. We're going to have content coming up on the Visual Studio channel here on YouTube. We're going to put together Visual Studio here on YouTube. Here on Twitch, we're going to have Visual Studio content coming over on Mixer as well. We're going to be doing a lot more of these. I have one scheduled. If you look at the events page, I can announce we're going to be doing the we're going to be doing a Xamarin you build your first app with the folks from Xamarin University and a couple other guests who have a little bit of Xamarin expertise. We're going to be doing that on Friday, August 10th. So head over back over to the events page on Twitch and click that remind me button for our next workshop all about building your first mobile app using Xamarin. That'll be C sharp. And you can do all of that free with the tools. We'll make sure that you have all the information so you can join in. And we're going to go through. That's going to be one whole day where we're going to build a brand new app from scratch from one session into the next. All right? So I think it's time to play that music. It's been a long day. It's 6 o'clock my time. I think it's time for me to call it here and for me to get some rest because we're going to be back at it again tomorrow starting at the same time we're going to write some code together because it's saturday morning all righty thanks so much everybody for joining me for any part of the day that's right chris good night have a good weekend everybody take care we'll see you